well, it's Friday, and uh, I think it's the 4th, it's April something. Who the fuck cares? We're all stuck indoors, and uh, some of us are working from home, or some of us are flat up out of the job. So I took Friday off because I've been wanting to make a video, and in this video, we're going to be talking about two different amazing polysynths, the Novation Summit and the ASM Hydrosynth. Uh, these are two completely different machines. One of them is all digital DSP, and the other one is almost completely analog with the exception of the oscillators themselves and the effects. But um, basically, you're going to be hearing stuff going through analog circuitry here and stuff being simulated going through analog circuitry here and being done quite well, I might uh, add. So um, at the end of this, there's really not going to be a winner. But um, maybe if you only have one of these and you're thinking about getting another, um, you know, this might help you. I'm going to be talking about the patches I did for each of them because I've done a one patch collection each for these. And um, then we're also going to go through stuff that's more applicable to just generally, you know, being a general user like sound design. Um, I can, you know, we'll do some filter comparisons. We'll do some, uh, you know, talk about the envelopes, just all the, all the, you know, the regular bases, you know, LFOs, envelopes, filters, um, oscillators, waveforms. Uh, they're both digital um, wavetable capable synthesizers with the ability to kind of morph or fade between different waveforms. And so... I thought, you know, this is just, this is a, I, these are my two favorite synthesizers, just <laughs> to give you a, a kind of a, um, an idea of what you're dealing with here. I am in love with both of these equally. Um, I, I, in fact, I probably wouldn't want to own just one. Um, I think they go great together. And um, I think the differences I'm going to show you between the two are rather than being kind of like a one up to the other one, it's more like a compliment to the other one because what one doesn't offer the other one tends to provide it. So <clears throat> let's get to it. I'm James, you're watching Major OSC, and this is the comparison shootout between, sorry, not shootout. This is the comparison between the ASM Hydrosynth and the Novation Summit. Uh, this one's called Deckard's Ride. filter on this. Now remember this is analog circuitry. It's got 12 uh, dB and 24 dB uh, modes. Let's get rid of the reverb and uh, delay and chorus so you can get a better idea of what this thing sounds like raw. Sounds pretty, that's a pretty stark difference, stark contrast. Um, so first point I'm going to illustrate is the effects on the Summit are phenomenal. They are the best effects I've ever heard in a synthesizer by a mile. They are unbelievably good. In fact, I would, I would go as far to say if you're in the market for a polysynth and you're like, I want to get an external effects box too, don't buy both. Just buy this because you can run external gear and use the effects on this. And they are so good. First big thumbs up is the effects on this. They're absolutely fantastic. Let's go to another patch here. Obviously, this is a powerhouse of a polysynth that's got 16 voices, uh, you know, to work with when you're in single mode. Okay, so here's one that I did called Shockwaves. It's sort of uh, the plural version of the actual name of the patch collection. <laughs> Just killed the effects for a second here. So it's got two LFOs on this thing that do... Um, here, let's get you a better view here so we can... Okay, so L LFO sections are... Uh, section is up here. Um, LFO 1, LFO 2. Then you have two kind of general or generic, or as they call it, global LFOs. These are not uh, 
t these cannot be uh, synced with keys. So these are kind of free flowing. So any kind of modulation you're going to be doing using um, that to add just movement, uh, especially with you know, the shape and um, general filter, you know, a little bit of filter movement or a little bit of detune. This is actually the way to go. In fact, I would, if it were me designing it, I would have a third option on these three oscillators each for having, os you know, global LFO3 modulating the shape because a lot of times I want a little bit of movement in these shapes. I don't want LFO1 doing the tasks. I like LFO1 to do other stuff like triggering the volume of an oscillator itself to get kind of sequence style sounds. Now, you can run an ARP. Sorry, bad example. You can run arpeggiators um, on this and, uh, you know, have have it sequenced that way. And there are a bunch of different kind of uh, ARPs, uh, kind of uh, ARP patterns that you can do. Let's find one called Deep Blue Serp. <laughs> That's using the ARP. That's a pattern. That's preset. Well, I what I like to do in a lot of my sound design is I like to make interesting patterns using LFO1 and LFO2. As long as they're temp, you can sync them with tempo, and as long as you can sync them with trigger, uh, you know, key triggers. So LFO1 and LFO2 are full featured LFOs. They can be um, adjusted as to where in the waveform of the LFO it starts. Uh, how fast it fades or how fast it comes in. So you can do either or. Re it's really versatile and it's a fantastic uh, way of um, being able to um, get them exactly how you want it. So this one has an actual function, no modulation required, where you can program how long you want the LFO to be in effect and then it's gone. And you can treat that as a gate or you can treat that as a, a fader. So you can either do abrupt or smooth. So that gives you even more options. I'm just a big fan of the LFOs on this because without these, I really couldn't do any kind of patches with movement with the exception of Deep Blue Surf since that's an ARP. But uh, I'll give you another example of a great one that has no ARP on it, but it still has a lot of movement. Limitless, I call it this, this one. <laughs> Let's talk about envelopes on this. Let's go to a patch that has good, very clear envelopes in use. Maybe a pad or a pluck. There we go. Perfect. Spirit Catcher Bass. By the way, if you don't know who Spirit Catcher is, go check them out. Um, they did a lot of progressive house and kind of uh, new disco in the 2000s, and I think they're still, they're still kicking it. Anyways, they have a... They just have such a good uh, way of um, of doing analog stuff. I think they have a Jupiter 8 and a bunch of other really, really expensive uh, vintage synthesizers, and they tour live with this shit, and they're just fucking gifted. And Gotta give us something that you ain't had before. That, you know, one of their biggest influences, I think, is Quincy Jones and Michael Jackson. <laughs> So I did a patch that's uh, kind of akin to, you know, something they would, something they would do. Oh, I have my, I have my foot on the sustain pedal. Oops. So the envelopes. One drawback of the envelopes is that you cannot adjust the curve. So you can't, the envelopes are, they're static in that sense. However, they are still analog. They are analog envelopes. So really... <laughs> We don't, I couldn't tell you that they're exactly um, linear. They very well could be, uh, you know, have some kind of natural um, logarithmic or, I can't remember the other one, or al <laughs> exponential uh, curve to them on the ASM Hydra synth, for example. You can adjust that, and that is huge. That is a big ability because that will definitely affect how you can get bass patches and plucks to sound. Um, however, I've really never found it to be a big limiting factor in the Summit because they're analog envelopes, they're snappy and they're quick, and you never have to modulate them to velocity at all because you can 
go to the envelope as a global parameter and edit the velocity sensitivity. So that means envelope one is controlling the filter on this one. If I turn the velocity up to full, 63, right? And so the filter is basically closed when I'm pressing it lightly and opens wide up to a full filter modulation. So basically it's like, it's sort of like mod, uh, modulating the envelope depth um, in a way. Right? Okay, so overall though, um, you know, there's two, there's two main envelopes. They can be looped, but you can't tempo sync the loops. So I don't really find much use in the ability to loop them, but if you're doing a little bit more, uh, a little bit more avant-garde or a bit more ambient and kind of um, creative free-flowing stuff, the looping envelope is certainly a welcome addition. Okay, well, aftertouch. Let's talk about that. Aftertouch on this is, uh, um, it's stiff. It's not that bad though. Some people have complained and said it's damn near impossible to press it. Well, I'm sorry, you probably have a defective keyboard and I'm hoping to God that you have some kind of warranty arranged and have something in process to do an exchange because if you are if you are literally hurting your finger trying to get the aftertouch engaged, then there's something wrong. I don't have a problem getting aftertouch engaged on this. However, it does take a little bit of force. Also depends on where on the key you press it. Much easier to press in the middle than on the edge. You really do have to give it a lot more force on the edge. So I think it's just the way it's designed. All right, so let's stop there. We've covered uh, LFOs and envelopes and a um, little bit of the filter and talked about aftertouch. Let's jump over to the hydrosynth and talk about, uh, let's give that, you know, the hydrosynth it's, um, it's fair due and um, we'll cover that. Then I'm gonna go back and kind of um, go a little bit quicker between the two and do some direct comparisons. Okay, let's talk about the ASM hydrosynth. Um, as I said earlier, this is an all DSP based synthesizer, so it has no real analog circuitry in it. Everything it's doing, it is doing because it was programmed to do so, and it was it's simulating analog circuitry, and it's doing it quite fucking well, I might add. Um, so this is a patch I made called Analog Heaven. structure of the synthesizer is laid out in such a manner that you just press one of these buttons over here and you are going right to that section and it's drawn out so you'll know the signal path and it's very helpful for sound designers it's very helpful for anybody who's trying to just get a sound to the way they want it even if you're adjusting an existing preset it's just a great great way of navigating and then once you press these buttons you know one of these buttons it's going to show up here very intuitive well thought out um very different way of doing things you know compared to the all the knobs on the uh, um, on the summit, but uh, anyways, it does filter emulation so well. Big big advantage on this one is you have a lot of versatility. Um, filter one types. The one I like to use is LP twenty four or Fat twenty four rather. Sorry, <laughs> there's L uh, Fat twelve. A little bit drier, a little bit more, you know, just. A little less squelchy. Still pretty cool though when you turn that res up. In fact, it's very, very, very ear pleasing. It's typically why I like to use it. It also has ladder 12 and ladder 24, which is more like a Moog filter. And here's ladder 24. Um, in addition to that, LP gate. MS20. Oh, it's got the high pass MS20 filter too. Um, so in addition to those uh, crazy filters, oh, maybe one more I want to show you here, and that is LP3. I cannot remember the name of this damn filter for the life of me, but this was based off of a filter that one of the developers had, and it was a uh, for a modular synth. That sounds great. Especially when you add some drive. 
So besides filter slot one, there's filter slot two, and uh, they can be run in parallel or in series. Um, so they can, you know, they they can both affect the sound together, or they can be in parallel, and you can send oscillators as you choose one, two, three, um, and and ring modulator and noise. You can send those all to whatever filter you want. So filter two is not interchangeable though. It's one dedicated SEM style filter. So that's like a, something on a um, on an Oberheim. So, like the OB6, perfect example. And what this lets you do but overall they did a fantastic job so let's move past the filter i probably covered it a little bit way too much but there's a lot of filters so envelopes there's five of these fuckers five envelopes this is a big advantage over the summit the envelopes and the lfos the reason why is because there's so fucking many of them sorry for swearing but i'm just very passionate about it not only that but they're all tempo syncable they're all loopable doesn't matter you can tempo sync an LFO, you can tempo sync an envelope. You can uh, have them as legato, so play one note and then continue playing notes without letting go. The pattern will continue exactly as it was intended in rhythm. So with this, I'll give you an, I'll give you an example of, of what you can use that to your advantage for. I'm gonna go to the, one of my favorite patches. It's like uh, inspired by nine inch nails. It's called 10 inch nails. Um, okay, so I kind of programmed a snare for two and four. Right, so you got that, you know, it's, it's supposed to be something akin to like, um, you know, his original. Let's try that again. Yeah, it's it's tough to play. Easier in a DAW. Anyways, what as you can see, as long as I'm continuously pressing a note and not letting go of it, the two and the four continue as they're supposed to. If I let go. how it's on the offbeat now right here's the difference right so it consent you know it's it's consistent versus letting go so that's a feature on the lfos and it is um sorry, on the envelopes, legato. So you set an envelope to legato, it functions the same way, right? As long as you're holding down notes, it's gonna, it's not gonna re-trigger. So you have the choice of uh, setting it to re-trigger or legato. So as far as creating kind of sequence style sounds, for me, this was a dream. This, this thing is fucking amazing. Um, and it's so flexible. So um, let's see, I'll, give, I'll get you some more examples. So. So basically, this is a sequence style patch that I made that uh, fucks around with the vowel filters um, and does just a lot of other stuff. It's it's modulating um, rhythmically the distortion levels or the drive, um, the sh wave shaping, all sorts of stuff. And of course, there's macros on this thing. If you've seen other videos on the Hydrosynth, you'll know there's a lot of flexibility as far as macros go. So um, this kind of is going to segment into the uh, advantage, disadvantage section between these two. So um, first thing I want to mention is uh, this thing is so much better at doing uh, sequence style patches. Um, 
because it has five fucking LFOs and five envelopes to work with, and they are all equally capable. There's no extra envelopes. Actually, there is an extra envelope thrown in. That's for uh, vibrato only, and that is in the voice section. So, you know, if you're... Uh, it's actually default, too. You can go right in and adjust the speed of that envelope, uh, of that LFO. You can adjust the amount slightly. That's one. That's the minimum. Well, like technically zero is the minimum. Goes up to 10, 10 hertz. So quite useful for vibrato if you're going to be using it for the mod wheel. But typically I like to use that for aftertouch. But that's only two mod slots it takes up. Not a big deal. Anyways, overall, the envelopes and the LFOs on this are just, they're so fucking good. Um, maybe not as natural and plucky as an analog sounding LFO, uh, or rather uh, envelope. Um, but honestly, the uh, difference is minuscule. This thing can sound as analog as it wants to. Now, sounding analog and being analog are two different things. So what I mean by that is that... Um, Psychologically, I think when we know when we're playing something that's truly analog, I think our brains, depending on how old you are and what kind of sense you've played in the past and what your you know what you've what your preconceived notions are, um, we tend to think of it as smoother, um, more natural, more uh, pleasant to the ear, less harsh. And um, I am guilty of that myself. I find that um, all the analog synths I've owned tend to sound still more fatter, more ear pleasing than this. This just requires a lot of extra work to get it there, but it can get there. It can get really beautiful sounding, and I'll give you an example. The effects aren't aren't amazing, but they're still they're good enough to get the job done. And it's got an EQ, two slots for an EQ if you need to. So you just gotta you just gotta crank away at it. You know, this thing is sort of like an open palette, uh, ready to be programmed. You know, an, uh, what do you call it? A, you know, a dev kit for a synth. Okay, so this one showcases the polyphonic aftertouch, which is a big fucking deal. Um, but I'm gonna do that, you know, in the in the back, you know, in the in the side to side comparison here in a minute. As you can see, it's got a nice, pleasant reverb, a very soft sound. actually say this can be your digital analog go-to if if um if you know if you like this over what the summit has to offer you'd be perfectly happy with this it has so many waveforms and so many different um things digitally to offer and then in addition to that it has that crazy ability to just emulate all these different filters it's it it can kind of it can do anything um so and that's partially why i love it but um Going back to that whole psychological thing between analog and digital, um, I still think that when I'm playing stuff through the summit, it just tend, it's a little bit easier to get it there, to get it to that ear pleasing, perfect sweet spot. Um, in fact, it's much easier to get it there, and um, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact it's going through real analog circuitry and it significantly high quality analog cir circuitry, I might add. And um, yeah, so that's something to think about. Uh, this one still feels, you know, the summit still feels like an analog. An analog synth to me in, in many ways and that's kind of what their intention was um so uh, yeah now that we've covered the lfos the envelopes and the filters of this as well as the summit uh next section we're going to do we're going to just go you know, side to side and talk about the differences the big differences between the two and um you know how that's relevant okay now we're in a we're in a pretty good view showing both of these synthesizers first thing you'll you probably know already asm is a very very new company they are less than a year well they're not their product is less than a year old um they unveiled this at knobcon if i'm not mistaken i believe they did a little bit of pr before that but 
Um, so yeah, I drove, I drove to, um, Knobcon, uh, for the day and, um, and was just blown away by how much thought they put into this. This is the first, let me give you some context here. They really did a good job in listening to what people wanted. People have wanted polyphonic aftertouch in a polysynth fucking ever. In general, you're, 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 the main offerings for polysynths do not include polyphonic aftertouch. Having poly aftertouch is, it was, it, uh, to be honest, I don't think I would have bought this synthesizer if it didn't have polyphonic aftertouch. As a sound designer and somebody who loves that you know, aftertouch to begin with, that was what convinced me. And that is the single biggest advantage this has over the Summit. And the funny thing is the Summit supports it. So it's actually awesome to own both because you can send that poly aftertouch message right over to the Summit and all your patches on the Summit that have uh, aftertouch programmed into them now have poly aftertouch capability. Um, so the Summit being smart, you know, Novation being smart about that was, was, a, <laughs> it was, that was a good decision on their part. Now, let's go into the keyboard here. The two different keyboards, too. Very, very different feel. This has a much deeper um, deeper throw or deeper feel to it. Um, not the deeper feel. It's deeper travel. It's longer travel. And... So, uh, and, and this one has a very short travel. <laughs> going to be a little bit quicker on the summit to be honest with you you can if you're somebody who can do really fast fingering um you will fucking love the summit it is designed for that i think um typical keyboard players who can do those really awesome solos um and you find yourself right at home when this feels as good as any of the great roland keyboards out there um i had a jd 8000 that i really liked the keyboard on i had a um sorry jp 8000 like the keyboard on that. Um, I had a MIDI controller, the R, the, let's see, the, not, what is it? Roland A33. That's a fucking old one, but it was a, it was a good one. I love the action on that. Um, good action on this. Um, it's just, it's short and um, the poly aftertouch, or sorry, the aftertouch is very stiff um, to most people. For somebody who's dealt with other Novation keyboards, such as the Novation SL, I had one of those, the uh, the small one. The uh, aftertouch on that was a little softer, but not much. Um, it's pretty comparable. So you, I don't. I think if you get them, you know, unless you have one of the defects, um, and you shouldn't because they fixed that. Uh, you should have no problem with the aftertouch on this. So, uh, and the keyboard just feels so good, and it's so fun to play. It's got a great dynamic, um, natural kind of dynamic feel. Although it's not very, um, it's not very adjustable for poly uh, for regular aftertouch. It is adjustable for uh, dynamics and stuff. So the velocity sensitivity of this is adjustable, just not the aftertouch. On this, the aftertouch is adjustable and the velocity um, sensitivity is adjustable. And it's not just linear. They have one called natural, which is typically what I like to use for aftertouch. And I think that has some kind of curve that they figured out most people would enjoy better than having just a, a linear feel. And um yeah, I think that's uh, that's pretty interesting, and that's just an example of how well they thought out this sense, just how in depth they went. Um, not that we're just, you know, they didn't just think we're going to have poly aftertouch. They thought we're going to have poly aftertouch, and we're going to have it feel really good and feel really natural, or just you know, just very well controlled and very um, easy to operate. Um, and another nice thing about the aftertouch on this compared to the summit is that you can adjust when it kicks in. So there's basically you, it's like sort of like an ADSR envelope. You can, uh, configure when it actually is applied. So that way, if you're somebody who likes to, you know, if you listen carefully, you'll actually hear the aftertouch being applied right after I hit it. I can make a more dramatic example of that. There we go. Okay. So listen carefully. Come on, come on. Right? That's the, what you're hearing is the time that I prefer to have the aftertouch kick in. It's pretty close to immediate, um, but not, I think it's 100 milliseconds or 150 milliseconds by default. You can have that 
at zero if you want. So as soon as you press it, however hard you pressed it, it's basically already into the aftertouch travel, which is a neat thing to be able to do too, especially if you're playing really kind of soft legato stuff and you don't need to, and it's not velocity sensitive as much, um, or maybe it is, but point being is it's it's so versatile and very accommodating to anybody's style um and also you can you can tell it when you want it to let up so if you let mm. off the key um you can you can have it fade a little slower than just being abrupt i kind of wish that was something built into the patches because that would be great if you want to op- press it down and then let go and have the filter sort of like a filter release kind of fade slowly slowly so something along the lines of you know like you'd hear from Vangelis, um, but you know it's it's a it's a global kind of settings parameter um, that is not per patch. Oh well, no big deal. So, but uh, you know other than that, I just really great, well thought out keyboard. Uh, it's forty nine keys, right? I think it's a small. Most people say it's small. Um, for what I'm doing. Uh, I've, the only time you're limited is when you want to play Van Halen's Jump or when you want to, uh, when you have to, you know, playing a full uh, comp, you know, accompanying, uh, you know, doing the lo- the bass and the and up top, you know, it can be limiting. Not a big deal. If this is your only keyboard, I think you're going to survive just fine. You know, if you're looking to get a main MIDI controller, this definitely, I mean, it's worth it. It's got poly aftertouch. Um, so, yeah, there's the big differences between the two keyboards. A lot more keys, no poly aftertouch, great feel, shorter throw, quicker, um, and adjustable velocity. Adjustable velocity, poly aftertouch, um, you know, lots of accommodating options, deeper throw. Still, you can still be quick on this. You know, just takes a little bit more effort. Uh, and then 49 keys, so there's your differences. All right, um, let's cover the waveforms next. Let's talk about uh, the oscillators and the waveforms. And this is a big one. And I think this video is probably going to end up being more than an hour as a result. So um, Novation Summit has um, numerically controlled oscillators, as they call it. And um, I believe there are 43 different wave tables. It supports all the main ones, uh, sine, uh, triangle, saw pulse width square or square and pulse width um, and that's controlled by the shape and then when you press this little toggle thing here you can see the light um illuminated when you go to more now we're gonna have to turn off oscillator two for a minute then that cues up this screen to show the wavetable selection for oscillator one shit tons of them a really cool way of getting initial inspiration and that's just one of the big advantages of the summit is the ability to instantly modulate the wavetable um to uh an envelope or an lfo in this case on this knob hands-on it's going to be modulatable to lfo i'm sorry to mod envelope one which is the same as the filter and LFO one. So, and then you have manual. The manual is the starting point of your waveform. Right now we're in dub. Well, let's go to deep. I'm going to take it all the way to the left edge of um, versus the right edge. That's basically the whole wavetable you're hearing. Let's use a different one actually. Something a little bit more abrupt. Better. Okay. This is the a little bit more of a formant vocal sort of filter. It's called E. <laughs> um, so I have set the all the way to the left, the knob. And now I'm going to go to mod envelope one. I'm going to set it all the way to the right. What's doing is the full travel. And the decay is going to determine um, how fast it comes back. It's going to start. Now, if you do it, if you add attack, it's going to start at, you know, it's going to be from the starting point the left side or basically of the initial starting point um and then it's going to rise up and then it's going to rise back down so if you have no attack it'll start at the opposite end if you have some attack it'll start at the bottom wherever your manual is 
So I hope I explained that right. Sorry if I didn't. That's neat because um, with just a little bit of attack and fair amount of decay, you can create these really neat um, dynamic kind of sounds. Attack, decay, and release especially uh, are important because if you add some release to your amp envelope, right, and you're going to have some, it's going to be more, it's going to have a longer hold or longer notes. Um, then release is a big deal because release is going to be how it is also going to affect the shape and the position of the uh, wavetable after you let go. So if I have a release, a very short, like no release, it goes right back to zero when it's bam, add some release, watch what happens. This is great when you have long notes. Because hear all that interaction. A lot of stuff going on, even after you press the note. Now I add a little bit of reverb. A little bit of chorus. That's not even filter, that's just the, that's the, the waveform. Sort of sounds like a high-pass filter though, doesn't it? Give you some other examples here. Thing is a monster for pads just an absolute monster so that um, is one of the things that is very nice about the summit is just the quick instant ability to modulate your wavetable and add some basic effects and you already have a very usable patch a very simple patch but very usable very accessible that's the beauty of this thing. It can be as simplistic and beautiful as it wants to be whenever it wants to be. All it takes is a little bit of input from you. It's got all these hands-on controls instantly available to you. We could do saw and just add super saw to it, which I love doing. So we're just going to go to oscillator. Oh, and while we're at it, why don't we go to oscillator one? I'm sorry, the oscillator common section, and we're going to add diverge and drift. What that does is basically turns the oscillators into something that behaves more like a VCO, which is a little bit unstable, nothing that's quite perfect. If you do it too much, it's going to sound like it has a lot of detune all the time. In fact, I'll turn off, de I'll, I'll make these exactly the same pitch so there's none of that, and now you'll hear the effect of the drift and the diverge. Completely off, right here. Drift turned up to 30. See, as, as you increase each of these, you get more and more of kind of an organic, alive feel. So it's always good to have something dialed in for these if you're looking to have more natural movement. So let's go to oscillator two and turn up the saw density. 
Oops, that's oscillator one. Oh, and by the way, the saw density, or otherwise known as super saw on this and the detune, they do not work on the uh, normal or on the wavetables. That is a big difference. Huge difference, in fact. I kind of wish it did. You can get it as trancy as you need it. I'll turn off the effects so you can get a better idea. You can also dial in uh, under voice. You can dial in the spread a little bit, so... full spread. What this does not do is it does not do individual panning. You cannot individually pan oscillators on this. That is the trade-off you get when you're dealing with analog circuitry. What the effects do and what the re reverb does and the, and the spread is good enough to make this very, very capable of producing very wide sounding pads and plucks and whatever you want to make. It, it, it has a very wide sound stage. You can get it to sound as big as you want it to. It can produce a wall of sound. In contrast, well, not in contrast, in comparison to the hydrosynth, the hydrosynth is digital and it can pan oscillator one and two. And that's a huge feature to have because it creates a natural stereo field and you don't have to use chorus or anything else like that. And that's also what I took advantage of when I made the sound, when I made the patch collection for this. I'd say 80% or more of the patches have the stereo macro that basically individually pans oscillator one and two apart from each other and then if that is the case most times i have programmed oscillator one and oscillator two to have mutators that are identical or almost identical so and then yeah we'll get into that in a second here so i think we're pretty far into uh covering the uh oscillators capabilities on this um there's some stuff i didn't touch on that i'm gonna touch on briefly the v-sync So that's kind of neat. You can modulate that. Um, that's one of the parameters. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of a shame that the other waveforms or wavetables uh, couldn't add, couldn't be turned into super saw style waveforms or couldn't be stacked, so to speak. Although, in, in you know, in uh, the only argument I'd make to say that's probably not that big of a deal is that the chorus on this thing is so fucking powerful and so high quality that you can get the you can get the wavetables to sound fat and wide in fact in comparison to that i'd say the waveforms wavetables whatever you want to call them overall are higher quality and much more instantly usable and just thicker and more kind of present than here you really have this one has a lot of tingy and tangy thin waveforms um, which can be used to your advantage and i'll explain that later but um, overall, this one has mu just much more straightforward and uh, quick to find sweet spots. So maybe I'll use one more example here. Let's see, flame is a cool one. That's just chorus. That's uh, four tap chorus. And here's ensemble. One thing I don't like is the rate who would ever want the rate that high like the knob doesn't need to go push it that far <laughs> in fact most of the time i'm working between the first dot and i know you can't see that very well but let's see if I... <laughs> i'm working i'm working between this first dot and like the third dot so like maybe ha not even a quarter turn <laughs> Already, I don't like that. No, it doesn't work for me. And you know what? On the side note, minor pet peeve, every fucking person to demonstrate this has done it way too much and never hit the sweet spot. Doing that, just dial it in so it sounds good. We don't need to hear it like this. Same applies to Super Saw. You don't need to turn it up to max and then right back. That's not useful. Turning it up to the sweet spot is much useful for people that are on the fence trying to figure out, does this have a good Super Saw? Does this have a good chorus? Etc. Sorry, ramble over. Okay, let's jump on the hydrosynth and uh, talk about those oscillators. 
oscillator one, two, and three right here. From there, you're selecting the pitch, the waveform. You have the single mode, which is saw, uh, or sorry, it's defaulted to saw, but you can individually select. Right? Then you switch it over to wave scan. So it's not instantly built in like it is on the Innovation Summit. It is a mode you have to turn on for wave scan. This is also different than the Summit in that when you select a waveform, it's not, you're not selecting a wavetable, you're selecting a waveform. You make your own wavetables on this thing for the most part. It does have other wave waveforms that are all named the same in sequential numbers. So I'll give you an example. First one is horizon, or actually technically it's pulse, but. So you got pulse one all the way through pulse six. It's not an even pulse width thing. It's, a, a, it's there are different differences as you can tell. However, you can still do pulse width modulation. I'll show you that in a minute. But yeah, hori like there's a lot of these that have eight waveforms and they're all named horizon, for example, or they're all named flux or they're all named, you know, whatever it is. Some of them have four, some of them have th three. Kind of a pet peeve of mine. I think if you're going to add, if you're going to make wavetables, make them all eight. Here's why. Because when I'm going and cycling through these, if you hold the shift button, they will all, all the other ones will select the next sequential one. So once I've selected horizon one on slot one, it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Once I've selected horizon one and, I, and I'm holding the shift button, everything else is horizon two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So now if I back out of that waveform select grid one through eight, and I turn the wave scan button to max, see that it goes through the entire wave table it is now a wave table from there if you're if you're set on that if you're settled on the one you like you go to mutant one and mutant two they are identical in what you can select so you have the ability to select fm wave stack which is like superstar oscillator sync that's a lot like v-sync on the novation summit Pulse width original, pulse width squeeze, which has got a bit more grit, a little bit different up. It's just, it's different. Um, but also very desirable. More of a gritty kind of uh, grungy um, pulse width. Think about it like that. And then pulse width ASM, which is great to dial up if you want saturation without drive. There's dry. That's wet. Depth is at 64. As you notice, the depth makes no fucking difference. The only thing that makes a difference at this point is the feedback. Right? Here's the, here's the cool part about the uh, PW ASM, or Pulse Width ASM. The custom edit menu breaks it down into eight different sections. Let's add the... We'll go to 20... We'll go to 32 for feedback, and we'll do depth... 128 full right ratio is at one now watch that watch what happens we're in the we're in the custom edit grid right so right here you're seeing the mode up here right and then you can select the mode then it's blank right here and then for this one it's ratio depth blank feedback custom and dry wet now custom doesn't do anything when i twist it but when I press this, it goes into a menu. Now, on more simplistic waveforms, this tends to work a little better. So to further demonstrate it, we're gonna go back to, and just switch it to, we're gonna switch oscillator one back to saw. Here's a nice, another nice thing. Even though I just turned oscillator one back to single mode, if I switch it back to wavetable mode, all the stuff I dialed in, it'll remember. Which is really nice. So if you have, want to audition a patch you just made and you just want to ditch the entire wavetable that you'd been working with, you can go right back to saw. And, and, but it'll remember it in case you want to go back. 
now we have a saw waveform, and we're going to try that same thing with the PWASM. Custom. Now we're in the warp table. Lots of different options. Now when you go to the mutant depth, now you got something pretty neat. This thing is a distortion machine, and it is awesome at doing it. If you have a rock band, in fact, I'll just say this right now. If you have a rock band and you and you need something that that to back up the electric guitar with a lot of oomph, you know, or if you like Nine Inch Nails and you have a band that kind of plays industrial stuff, this is the fucking synth to buy. This is an industrial powerhouse. And I will at towards the end when I do the best patches for each, I'll give you a perfect example of that. Well, you've already heard one so far. That was the Ten Inch Nails patch, but there's a bunch of other ones. And the last of the mutators, sorry, we got a little off topic there. Last of the mutator modes is harmonic. Which does exactly what it says. It adds harmonics. All right, so that covers the oscillators for this thing. Um, mixers are both set up in a very similar way. The only difference is this one has two filters, so you can fade and modulate where you want each one to go. I'll give you an example of what that can do. Uh, perfect example here, Epic Williams. This is the trumpet kind of brass patch I made. Okay, so back to the point I was making. You can program a macro to fade between filter one and two, and that macro can assign oscillator one, oscillator two, oscillator three, whatever it needs to, to jump from filter one to filter two. You have to run them in parallel if you're doing that. Can't If you're running them in series, it's not going to make a difference. It's still passing through filter one. So if you want them passing through filter one or two discreetly, you have to run in a C, uh, parallel. So that's one of the macros here. SEM amount. <laughs> I guess I just named it for the filter two. So SEM amount basically fades everything over to filter two. For some reason, every time I play that, I think of like Dumb and Dumber when that uh, that dog mobile goes flying over the off the. Anyways. Or maybe I'm thinking of a Chris Farley movie. I don't know. Some comedy I remember. It has that same kind of cheesy trumpet. This reminds me of a trumpet from a JV 1080. Also, well, you know, it's not. It doesn't. It sounds nothing like a fucking trumpet. It sounds like a synth trying to do a trumpet. It's still fun to play though. So, anyways. Anybody uh, will tell you the filters make or break a synthesizer, you know, make all the difference. So the fact that his has two filters definitely does play a role on how good or bad the oscillators can sound. Keep that in mind. There's so much variety. Even if this thing has some questionably strange thin waveforms, the filters can kind of make up for that. This thing is a key monster. You can make really great keys. That's the ant. Oh, that's a big analog bass sting right there. Here we go. And also because there's eight slots for waveforms, or eight, you know, an eight-position wavetable, if you want to call it that. Um, the macros become even more fun to use because you can program the macros to jump around the wavetables, um, and and with that you can have the macros program different mod slots amounts. So one mod slot could mean us, uh, that envelope one or envelope three is modulating the position of wavetable or you know oscillator one's wavetable. Um, you can have that dialed in as a macro, so you can adjust that amount. So there's a couple of patches in this ignition sound set that I did um, 
that have they're basically patches built on macros. So <laughs> As you can tell, at certain points, it doesn't sound that good. It's a little thin, right? That's kind of a takeaway point. And that's what makes this a little trickier to program also, is that some of the waveforms are so undesirable in played by themselves, the only reason they would be useful is if they were used as a modulate, like an FM modulation source, or, and even that doesn't work most of the time, or uh, they're just a transient. So with so many different waveforms, I'd say 50% of them or more are actually only useful to me as transients versus an actual waveform that you'd want to hold with a note. But yeah, remember, this is a comparison. So this obviously is going to be a lot more deep when it comes to modulating the oscillators and their waveform and their wavetable. Um, and that's kind of what its main thing is. That's main one of its main things. Um, it's a wave morphing synthesizer. So the effects on this, I don't like um, the traditional ones. I don't like, I don't like the chorus hardly at all. And I don't like the reverb much. The reverb can work though. It can sound very good. The reverb can sound good, but under one condition, you need to have movement going on in your oscillator. So that's some damn nice sounding reverb. else we have to cover we've covered the keyboards we've covered the feel oscillators filters for the most part this has a great filter um no matter what you're doing this, this has great filters <laughs> um let's see in a wrap up for the price they're both worth it very very worth it if you have two thousand dollars to spend um this might be overall some more use, possibly more useful to you. It's got more voices. It's got the ability to split into two separate synthesizers, so to speak. You, it has multiple outputs. So you can have a multi um, and have one patch running through output one and two, and then you can have the other patch running through output three and four. It also takes input from audio stereo signals. So you could have the hydrosynth running into it or anything else that you have and you can run through that beautiful chorus and reverb and uh, delay, very useful delay. Um, yeah, uh, overall navigating patches, uh, or I should say navigating modulation and, and stuff, this has a very pretty typical modulation matrix, as does this. They're just set up a little differently. Um, and they're both very hands-on. This one is hands-on, but it's such a quick way of menu diving, and it's so intuitive and very quick to modulate that um, it doesn't feel like menu diving at all because everything it's 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 per pay it's it's like the page you need is right there it's one press away and in fact it's what's uh has typically curved my interest in making macros i think oh i'm gonna make a macro that controls the delay or i should say the decay of envelope one wait a minute it's literally one button press away and then you can adjust it so why would i make a fucking macro just to do that even if it is immediately available right there. Sometimes you just got to think, okay, one button press is not the end of the world. That's not, I don't consider that menu diving. Um, Summit, there's a little bit more menu diving, but it's pretty well laid out. Um, they're all up here. Um, they're, you know, in categories, oscillator, envelope, and uh, LFO, ARP slash clock, FX, FX mod. That's like its own little mod matrix. And then mod, which is mod matrix, and then voice filter. Um, getting to know this is... I'd say just as challenging as getting to know this. They're just different kinds of challenges. Um, really, you'd want to just get to know their abilities first before you go trying to find everything and you know instantly doing sound design. It's better to just kind of 
go through their presets, which is the last part of this. We're going to go through presets. And I'm going to show you my favorite presets for each one. Some of them are going to be factory presets. Most of them are going to be my own presets, obviously, because what would this video be without a little bit of plug for major oscillator uh, uh, patch collections? So uh, let's start with the Hydrosynth because this has some just, I don't know, it was the most recent sound uh, or patch collection that I've done. And uh, I'm very proud of it. In fact, um, while, I'm, while I'm navigating to ones that I want to show, um, I've gotten emails. Um, and this hasn't, this only happened a few times with the Summit and the DeepMind patches, but I got an email from a guy. Um, I forgot his name. But he is a composer, uh, and he's doing. He's he's done compose. He's composed for TV shows and movies, and he's has an Amazon show coming out. And um, Greg Trippy, there it is. Greg Trippy, you can look him up. I think he's done a lot of B movie scoring, but uh, he's scored an a, a show that was on ABC, and he's doing an Amazon show that's coming out, something like The Wild or something like that. But um, comes out this summer, and he said he used one of the patches in here uh, that I from the ignition collection and um emailed me to tell me how much he likes it and i had a guy that's in a progressive german rock uh, progressive rock band out of germany he emailed me and in a very nicky lauda kind of austrian fashion he managed to insult and compliment me at the same time and that was just cracked me up because it's such a i i'm a big fan of nicky lauda and formula one and nicky lauda had a tendency of doing that you know of sound like well for a piece of crap it handled very well you know, and uh, I could get it dialed in, and then it was performing well. And you know, that's that's the kind of way he would talk. He would <laughs> insult you and then compliment you at the same time. Well, this uh, this German guy, this German guy told me that well, the piano does not sound that real. Uh, I found it a very expressive and incredibly useful for my. I was just like, well, no shit, it doesn't sound real. <laughs> he had to add that in. It does not sound very real. Okay, so I'd say 50% or more of these patches are all rhythmic in some way. Even the ones that I did not intend to be rhythmic ended up becoming rhythmic, because why the fuck not? You have so many envelopes and LFOs. When I'm done with every kind of sound design trick that I want to do to make a good sounding key or pluck, I tend to have two or three LFOs and two or three envelopes left over, or maybe one or two at least, so... That's what ended up happening a lot of the time. And that's what took so damn long in this thing is eight macros with eight slots each per macro, right? And then all the LFOs and envelopes. So it's like you think you're done and then you're like, well, maybe I'll fuck with this a little bit more and then do that. Oh, let's goof tonight. And there's another one called let's, let's moog tonight. They're both based on, on uh, a bass that you would place for a track like Let's Groove Tonight by Earth, Wind, and Fire. There's the piano. I was able to get a better, more realistic sounding piano sound on this than compared to the Summit. Neither of them sound even close to a piano, I might add. Do they sound better than a Casio piano from 1980 something? Fuck yeah, they do. Do they sound as good as an M1 piano? They don't. They might come close, but they don't. And M1 pianos weren't all that great. They were more like faux pianos, quasi pianos. Both of them do have that uh, nice, well, this one in particular, I programmed the higher notes to have shorter um, decay times than the lower notes, just like a real piano. Let's get to some more fun ones. Oh, I don't have my expression pedal, but this is the Viacom Stinger. And you're not even going to know what I'm talking about, so you're going to have to just go watch the video where I demo it. This is the monster... The monster patch I programmed. That's another good point. If you love dubstep or crunchy bro step slash trap, this is your go-to. This is the one you want. That'll do cool stuff, but this is the stuff you want to make trap with. This is the this is the machine. And then go buy some modular stuff too and hook it all up and create a spaghetti monster of fucking crunchy bro steppy rage. And enjoy your isolation. Funny though, this thing sounds like an organ when you're playing up top. Thank <laughs> you. 
It's a very, very old patch. That was one of the first ones I did. All right, let's go to the industrial stuff that I promised I'd, I'd show you. The Bruckheimer effect. This used to be slower. This is supposed to be for like a car chase from like a Bad Boys movie or from some kind of, you know, high speed chase. There's actually a variant of this patch that I renamed and kind of added a shitload more modulation to. And that one is called Mod Wheel Radio, if I can find it. There we go. So the beat is supposed to be like... Basically what's happening is that the, the mod wheel selects at which point oscillator 3 is going to be sequenced. Since their oscillator 3 doesn't have an ability to do 1 through 8 wavetables, it can only do one waveform at a time. The LFOs and the envelopes in their, all the modulation I did, it's just jumping oscillator 3's waveform around, so it's, it sounds glitchy. <laughs> I call it radio. It's like dialing in a radio station, finding which kind of industrial textures you like. Macro AT oscillator three after touch oscillator three. So you push it all the way down, it jumps up an octave. Dropping trombones, I actually heavily altered that patch and kind of restarted it and turned it into something like a brassy kind of brassy sequence. Rehab. So this one's heavily dependent on poly aftertouch. You let go and the saw kind of, the grungy saw kind of is is audible, but when you press it down it filters it out and so you can kind of create these kind of <laughs> Here's with no aftertouch here. No, here's with it applied rhythmically. I 
didn't realize I was uh, clipping. Hopefully, it didn't clip too bad. I'm going to use ink. Here's a basic bass. So this can still do old school sounding stuff. Yeah, I forgot. I forgot how to play Kenny Loggins. I think I've demoed the patches on this fairly well. You've heard all the other favorites that I had. Um, just really overall. Oh, here's another one. Vocal filter. That's got a big, this is a big advantage, having a vocal filter. some haywire and I suck at it because he's way way better at playing so with the eight macros on this as you can tell a lot of the times you can have a macro turn on, you know I'll turn on a macro and I'll have it programmed to do some rhythmic stuff so I guess the lack of knobs on this is kind of a downside, but with the ability to have eight macros control eight different parameters per macro on each of them and or toggle them on and off. And you can also have it toggle, like literally just press toggle where you press it and it's on and then you let go of it and it's off. With that ability, I'd say it makes up for having for not having as many knobs. Um, so you have nothing to worry about there. Um, any kind of knob that you want instantly available to you when you're performing, just program it in. All right, let's move on to some summit patches. And I'll see if I can move. Uh, that's probably because it'll be. Actually, I got a better idea. There we go. Okay. So lately, I have been making piano slash electric piano sounds on the summit, playing along with music I like. Initially, I did that because I started taking piano lessons. Um, via video, uh, remote video conference with a piano player that used to play along with my drum teacher back in the day and got a, got in touch with him and, you know, he's trying to make a, probably trying to make an honest buck and, uh, um, so yeah, took some piano lessons, but I didn't have, uh, until, until recently I didn't have a weighted piano, so I had to make something that at least sound like it, so I'm, you know, playing that a little bit. So... Oh, much better. Um, I have a couple of piano patches. This does really, really nice keys, really nice pianos. very similar patch and just have different effects and slightly different modulations. Yeah. 
So, moving on. So this will do movement and some kind of sequenced style patches. There's just less to work with. There's le there's fewer LFOs. Um, and keep in mind, LFO 3 and LFO 4 cannot be trigger synced. They are free running. It can be synced with rhythm as far as like 16th notes, 8th notes, quarter notes, that kind of thing. They're just not going to trigger every time you press a key. This one only uses LFO 1 and LFO 2. Overall, if you want something that'll sound like a lush classic polysynth of old, a Jupiter or a or anything really, this is the one. This is the one. It does. This sounds so fucking good. Go to the single patches here. Actually, no, we'll do a few more multis. Give you an idea here. That's dual. What was the other other one? Was I done with this one? Factory presets. That's fucking annoying. Hold on. Factory presets on this are very good, but not that great. I have a bias, though, obviously, because I'm a sound designer. And if it were up to me, I would have designed some of them. But, of course, I'm a nobody. So, I designed my own, and I released a patch collection for it. So, and you're welcome to check that out. Um... It's 20 bucks. It's called Shockwave, and it uh, has a lot of... It has a lot of ones that uh, really exploit the, the summit, or the peak, and it's also compatible with summit, obviously. Um, ASM Hydrosynth, I think it is such a versatile synth that the factory patches to a lot of people w might suck, in your opinion. And that is only because it's not a traditional analog or virtual analog even for that matter so i think there was so much the people that were assigned to do patches with i think there was so much for them to work with and, and in any direction they could take it it was really at the mercy of whoever was making the patches and what kind of music they like to make i'm of the mindset that if you're making music that people tend to like or a music that is typically accessible and very likable or easy to like or at least to not dislike then and you do a sound design you'll probably make more patches that are very likable by the general public. If you're doing a little bit more niche stuff, a little bit more experimental, if you're into modulars instead of polyphonic synths and you're just into the whole Eurorack thing, chances are you're more into making noise and effects than you are into making, say, an electric piano or a lush or, or a scorching lead or, or any kind of like something like this. <laughs> So, with that, I don't think the factory patches are very good, personally. I think some of them are very good, but only a few of them. The, 
the uh, they have a reenactment or a re- kind of a recreation of the Blade Runner uh, patch from Vangelis. I think that's like no, patch number ten or twelve or something. And then they have one that's uh, Blade Runner Blues that's very similar to a Vangelis patch from later on in that movie, uh, Blade Runner. But um, and those are fun and the Poly Aftertouch obviously is a joy to play. And so right off the bat, I guess the point I'm making is right off the bat when you get if you get either one of these, the factory patches are going to do just fine for giving you a, an initial fix, giving you initial joy run. But um, yeah, there's a lot of third-party patches available, obviously, uh, for both of these, and not just mine, too. Um, there's free ones. That, that there's a program you can get called uh, Components, and that has a bunch of free stuff from, like, Geosynth and Ian Hart and uh, various other um, sound designers, and each of them has their own kind of unique style. And there's always... You'll, you'll definitely find something you'll like. Um uh, for either of these, uh, but the stock patches might not be to your liking uh, for either of these. Um, I found it a little hard to find stuff that I liked. I'll find one that I do like, though, that's a factory patch, and that one is actually shit. I don't know if it's a factory patch or not, but it's in Bank C. Shit, it probably isn't, but it's um, it's the G-Force. It's one of Dave Spears' patches, I would, I would presume. Um, this, I think it's called Board in Canada. This is just going to kill it if you're into pads and lush poly stuff. grungy stuff just not as uh, grungy as not as grungy as the uh hydrogen i really personally feel that nothing sounds as good as the summit right now as far as just ear pleasing ear pleasing quality it's just it sounds fucking awesome um big fan of uh deep mind 12 and um a few others. OB6. OB6 is probably the only one that can sound better as, you know, analog saw style patches. But um, overall, this one's the this one's the supermodel. That one's the, the slutty, uh, grungy, crazy girl that knows how to do a bunch of wacky stuff that your supermodel girlfriend doesn't. There's your there's your comparison to women. This is the supermodel. And there's your mistress. There's your mistress. Hope you enjoyed the uh, comparison. I'm going to go have some homemade nachos that my wife just told me already. And um, thanks for watching this long video and hope you enjoyed it. Go check out MajorOSC.com if you haven't already. And uh, like and subscribe, yada, yada, all that crap. Um, and hopefully I'll, I'll have time to make some more videos. All right. Until next time, guys. See you later.